All right, in this video, we're going to talk about total war and how the war doesn't only affect the men fighting in the trenches, but also affects everybody at home as well. Uh, this is the first war in modern history that does that. You'd have to go all the way back to either the Napoleonic Wars in 1805 to 1815, or even as far back as the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s to, uh, to find a war that affects everybody's life on a daily basis. So that's what we're going to talk about today when we talk about total war. So we've been calling it World War I throughout this unit, but so far we've really only talked about Europe when we talk about all the different battles and strategies and countries involved. Uh, but the truth is that this war kind of spreads out. As, as both sides get bogged down on the Western Front and the Eastern Front, they look to tip the scales uh, outside of Europe. They try to go out to the colonies, out to uh, Africa and Asia and the Middle East to try to get an edge on the other side. And one of the most important battles uh, outside of the Western Front the Eastern Front is the Battle of Gallipoli, which happens at a strait in Turkey, which is part of the Ottoman Empire at this time. And in that battle, what happens is the Allies are trying to take control of this strait to get a new supply line to Russia because Russia couldn't be resupplied um, because of the Eastern Front bogged down there and also uh, unrestricted submarine warfare by Germany. Unfortunately, this battle, like every other battle we've talked about so far, ends as a stalemate and the Allies have to give up. And, and it is a particularly bloody one for not only the British, but more importantly, uh, Australian forces. Australia is a country we haven't talked about at all. They were part of the British Empire and now had home rule. They did their own thing. But Australians took the hit at Gallipoli, which really shows that this war is becoming more than just a European conflict. The war also has an impact, like I said, on other continents. Japan actually joins the side of the Allies in World War I uh, and attacks German posts in China and the Pacific colonies because they're hoping that by coming out on the winning side of this, they could take over all of Germany's uh, holdings and territories in Asia because Japan wants to build an Asian empire, something we talked about in the last chapter with the Russo-Japanese War. Um, France and Great Britain also attacked German colonies in Africa, like German East Africa, for example. The British fight uh, the German forces there in East Africa. Uh, the Indians join the British. A lot of Indians, what they're doing is they're not necessarily fighting on the front lines, but they're giving material support. They're helping to put materials together and ship them and help uh, behind the front lines. But even Gandhi kind of gets involved in this. The guy we always think of is, you know, about nonviolence, and and he at least supports. Indians supporting the British. And the reason he does that is he's hoping that by helping out that when the war is over they might get their independence as kind of like a favor from the British for helping them out during the war. So like we said at the beginning of the video, this war affects more than just the men on the front lines. It affects everybody who lives at home as well. Uh, we know a little bit about that from the Battle of the Somme documentary where we saw the PALS regiments and how so many people from the same town will go off to war and die. Um, and that's the home front. The home front is what we, ha what we call the people that lived back at home and weren't on the front lines, but were definitely, definitely impacted by the Great War. Um, in fact, this war, and we'll look at these numbers in class, had more casualties than all of the wars of the last 300 years in Europe combined. So it's definitely going to have an impact on everybody that lives at home. And this phenomena that everybody is involved and that the war consumes everybody's life is called total war which in some ways is using all of your country's resources to win, but it's also about every citizen being involved in the war in some way. Uh, they could be working in factories. They could be making materials. They could be um, writing letters. They could be nurses. Even just rationing, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, saving supplies and not using things as much that, so that they can be used for the war effort. Those are the kind of things that people could do at home to participate in the war without actually fighting. Now, what do I mean by rationing? Rationing is when people uh, are only allowed to buy and use small amounts or limited amounts of items needed for the war. Uh, so food, for example, metal, rubber, all the materials that might be helpful or foods that might be helpful for uh, supplying the troops. Um, when they're used at home, they have to be used in smaller quantities so that there's enough for the war effort. Now, imagine somebody told you that you could only drink coffee every other week, once every other week, or you could only use the internet, you know, 10 minutes a day. That would be really hard for you to do, right? Because these are things that you do on a daily basis that you're pretty used to 
uh, being able to do. So the way that governments got people to buy into these programs is through propaganda, which is one-sided information used to persuade somebody of a point or a topic. And it's got it's got sensory and it's stretching the truth and sometimes it's even lying. Uh, it's a little bit like modern advertisement in some ways. Um, but this is to kind of grab you and make you think and make you act very quickly uh, in the way that they want you to. So they use things like posters, they use music uh, and art to convince people to support the war effort. So here's an example of wartime propaganda. And this is a man who's sitting in his chair at his home with his daughter. Uh, and his son is playing with some toy soldiers on the ground. And it says, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? Now, what do you think that means? What do you think this poster is trying to say? Uh, I'll tell you, when I look at it, what I think is it, it probably means that, you know, if you were this man and your daughter was reading about the Great War to save civilization, and she asks you, like, what did you do in the Great War? Are you going to want to be able to say, I fought really courageously and I helped us win and now the world's a safer place? Or are you going to have to say, you know what, I, I, I dodged the war. I, I was too much of a coward. I didn't want to get involved. That's what this poster is trying to do. It's supposed to kind of shake men a little bit and say, like, what kind of a dad do you want to be when this happens someday? So, again, stretching the truth or exaggerating or playing on emotions um, to get a point across that you really should be fighting in the war. And not only did men play a really important role in the war, but women played an important role role as well because women were expected to work uh, at home in the home front because all these men go off to war and they're fighting in factories but we need someone to work in the factories the factories are now making materials and weapons and supplies for the war where they used to make things like cars now they make tanks um, so somebody's got to work in these factories and the women are at home so a lot of women end up working in the factories during the war and they make weapons in the factories um, they also worked as nurses, field nurses were mostly women, and that was a very important role with so many casualties in this war. Uh, but women had never been out of the home like this before, and it's the first time that women are given some of these quote-unquote man jobs uh, to take care of. And that's going to be really interesting when the war is over and they go back to the home. Uh, this will happen again in World War II, and after World War II especially, the question is like, well, wait a minute, why can't women have these jobs if they want them all the time? So this is a change in role for women uh, during World War I. Now, I know you've been wondering this throughout the entire unit. When does the U.S. get involved in World War I? And they do so uh, for a couple reasons. And it, it starts with when Germany declares that they're going back to this policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare. And what that policy says is that Germany will sink any ship around Great Britain without warning. doesn't even matter if it's a battleship or not. Uh, it's their way of cutting off Great Britain from their allies. Uh, and they go back to that policy in January of 1917. One of the ships that they sink earlier in the war, in 1915, is the Lusitania. And if you know what the Titanic looks like, you basically know what the Lusitania looks like. It's a, it's a cruise liner uh, that's sailing from the United States to uh, the British Isles. And it's carrying a lot of passengers, but it was also smuggling ammunition to Great Britain. So what happened is the Germans torpedoed the ship and it sank. And there were over a thousand civilians that died. They drowned or died in the, in the attack. This outrages the United States. They're like, we can't have this. Germany's killing our citizens. Um, Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, he warns Germany, but there's just not enough Americans yet that want to get involved in World War I. And when he runs for re-election in 1916, he actually promises to keep America out of the war. Uh, but that won't be able to happen for much longer. And the reason that can't happen is because Germany sinks three more U.S. ships after the Lusitania. Uh, and so the sinking of these ships is really just driving Americans nuts, and you can't really ignore this much longer. The other st uh, straw that breaks the camel's back happens in February of 1917 when officials, British officials, intercept a telegram message that was going from Germany to Mexico. And basically what they were trying to say to Mexico is that if you attack the United States and you keep the U.S. busy so that they can't come fight in Europe, that when we win, when the war's over, Germany will make sure that Mexico gets back their lost lands, the southwestern United States. United States that they lost in 1848 uh, to America, so modern-day California, New Mexico, Arizona. This outrages Americans. It gets published in the newspapers. People are so mad that they want to get in the war now, and Wilson asked Congress to declare war. So on April 2nd, 1917, the U.S. gets into the war for good. 
Around the same time that the U.S. gets in the war, Russia quits. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the next chapter. But Russia is hurting on the Eastern Front. Russia is suffering the most casualties of any country in this war. And the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, was forced to step down in March of 1917 as people basically uh, pressured him to quit. And again, we'll talk about that next month. Um, so the new government that takes over promises to stay in the war because they want to support the Allies, but they, it's just too much for the people. Uh, and there's a revolution in Russia that we'll study in more detail. And, and in March of 1918, the new revolutionary government of Russia signs the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, with Germany. And basically what that treaty does is it says that Russia can get out of the war, uh, but in return, Germany's going to get some land from Russia. Not only do they get some land, but they get about a quarter, one quarter, of all the land in Europe that Russians live in, so Poland and Ukraine and lots of territory for this. Uh, now, you would imagine if you were France or Great Britain, you'd be very upset when you found out about this treaty because now, now Germany can take all their troops from the Eastern Front and throw them onto the Western Front. So the balance is going to be off on the Western Front, and this really threatens the uh, survival of France and Great Britain in this war. What saves the Allied powers is the fact that the United States was entering the war at the same time that Russia quit. So the Germans make one last big push, and they send all their troops to the Western Front, and they actually push right back to where the first important battle of this war was, the Marne River in France, just, you know, 35 miles outside of Paris. This time, with the help of the United States, the uh, Allies are able to push Germany back again and push them all the way into Germany uh, because two million more U.S. troops uh, arrive by the end of this war, about 100,000 new troops from America a month. Uh, and that's going to force the scales to tip in favor of the Allied powers, and Germany's going to go down. Uh, other central powers start to surrender in 1918. Austria-Hungary's government collapses, and they give up. The Ottoman Empire collapses, they give up. And Kaiser Wilhelm is forced to step down by his military leaders uh, on November 9th, 1918. Two days later, on November 11th, 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, in 1918, uh, an armistice is signed, which basically is a ceasefire, ending hostilities almost four years uh, after this war starts, a little bit after, uh, a little bit more than four years after the war starts. And we'll talk about the impact of that war uh, in class. But here is a uh, newspaper front page from the armistice uh, explaining that the war is over here in America and canceling the draft and the Kaiser flees to uh, Holland to the Netherlands and seeks asylum after he quits. And this is a picture of uh, the where the armistice was signed. It was actually signed on a train car uh, just off the western front. And the Allied powers met up with the Central Powers and representatives from Germany to sign the ceasefire. So that is your explanation of the uh, total war and how it affected everybody and also how the U.S. gets involved in the war ends in 1918. And I know it was a lot, but we'll break all this stuff down piece by piece in class. So hopefully you filled in your sheets on this video, and we'll talk more about it when you come back to class.